Women Taking the Lead, Episode 122. I'm somebody who gets results. I'm reliable. I show up. I'm ethical. And believe me, there are a lot of people around who don't have all of those characteristics. There are a lot of people, especially in, in consulting and in my business, who talk the talk, but don't actually take action and get things done. So once I started realizing that, I started telling people that, you know, these are things that I can do that others can't, and it really has helped. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn, and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentl.com forward slash recognize to reserve your spot in our upcoming webinar on how to be recognized and rewarded for the work you do. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Joni Cannell, who is the founder of Flexible Work Solutions, a consulting firm that specializes in leadership assessment and development. She is the author of Flying Without a Helicopter, How to Prepare Young People for Work and Life. She received her doctorate from UC Berkeley and her bachelor's from Harvard. So you are no slouch, Joni, that is for sure. But tell us a little bit more about you and your own humble beginnings. Well, sure. Well, right now what I do is consulting, and I use my psychology background to do that, but also my engineering background, which is where I started. And that was my humble beginnings. I started right out of college being an engineer because my parents told me in no uncertain terms, this is the end of the financial support you're going to get. And so I knew I had to come up with a professional degree that I could do in four years uh, to actually make enough money that I wanted to be having a secure job and all that. And I went into engineering in Silicon Valley. And, you know, it was good. I, it was great money. And I got to do a lot of things I like to do. But I just didn't fit in. You know, speaking of being a woman, uh, it was 4% women in hardware engineering at the time. And it was just really an environment that didn't fit me. And the work itself I found to be um, very, you know, it was very interesting in terms of the people interactions and the dynamics there, but I didn't have a passion around building and debugging circuitry. So I realized at that point that I wanted to move into something more people oriented. And that was really scary on how to do that. You know, how do you move careers? I did it step by step moving into marketing kind of work, moving into consulting uh, as an engineer. But I kept finding that people wanted to push me back into engineering because that's where my background was. So I thought I needed to go back to school and get a new degree to really break out of it. And I didn't do that right away either. It took me a while. I did a lot of informational interviewing to figure out what I want to do. And I uh, also took some classes, did some volunteer work in the different areas to see if it was something that fit for me. And eventually I took the dive and left engineering and went back to graduate school. And I'm so glad I did ever since. And it's really been a great fit for me now consulting with a lot of technical people about the people skills needed to succeed as leaders in the workplace. And that's a huge gap that we have, especially as engineers and other scientists and, and other technical people, they aren't trained to do that in their education or in their jobs, frankly. And so having somebody can come in and help out with that is what I do. And I'm, I love it. Wow. What a great way to take your education and your experience and do work that you love and utilizing all of it. That, that, that's such a great makeup. I, and I often say whenever we were pivoting careers or shifting careers, rarely is the time we've spent wasted. We always find some way to put it to good use. And, you know, something else I really want to underscore about what you've shared, Joni, is um, I was actually just talking to a friend this morning who was saying how in her business, because she also does uh, coaching and consulting, she's she feels like she keeps falling back into work that she doesn't want to do because people keep telling her, oh, you would be so good at this. 
oh, you, you know, you should be doing this. And instead of really going after what she's passionate about, she keeps falling into doing what other people are suggesting she would be really great at, which is not what she loves. And she's actually carving out time to do nothing. Wow. (laughs) To get really clear about what it is she wants to do. And although you didn't take that, I actually, I don't know, because she's only taken a couple of days. It's not going to be like months on end, Mm -hmm. but it really takes stopping and reflecting on what it is you really want to do and then taking the steps that'll move you in that direction. So bravo. Congratulations. Well, thanks. I did take a lot of time to figure this out and traveled over in Europe and other places too, and had some time to reflect. I I left that part out of the story, but uh, yes, I definitely need time to reflect. Yeah, it does take that. And Joni, you've had success in your life and you've definitely gained confidence, you know, over the years and through your transitions. But take us back to a time when you were playing small and you may not have been aware of it at the time. Share with us the story and the lessons you've learned. Sure. Well, this was after graduate school. I got my degree in psychology, and I decided to go in and be a professor for CSPP, uh, California School of Professional Psychology, and that's here down in San Diego. And the professors at, at Berkeley kept telling us, well, you know, professors don't get paid a lot. You can expect to make this amount and you know, don't go crazy and think you're going to make as much as you would if you went into the business world, all that. So I went and applied for the job. I got the job and they made me an offer. And it was exactly what the professors at Berkeley said that I should expect. And so I took the offer. And the program director, who was my boss at the time, told me afterwards that he actually went in and boosted up my salary because he thought that I was getting underpaid and I hadn't negotiated for my salary. And I think that surprised him. So he went and did it for me. And I felt like such a heel later, like, wow, I really should have negotiated and asked for more. And it never really even occurred to me because I just thought this is what I was, you know, should expect to get. And finding out that everyone around me was asking for what they thought they could get and trying to maximize their income rather than just taking what was given to them. And that is a huge thing for women in general. I do a lot of work with women leaders, and the research shows that women often ask for what they think is reasonable, not for what they think they can get. And that's a big difference between the way women and men negotiate. And I fell right into that trap. Yes. And were you negotiating with men? Oh, yes. Yes. And the problem is I didn't negotiate because I got what I thought was reasonable. So I didn't even bother. But the program director was a man and he's like, you know, I I can't let this happen. (laughs) Right. Right. And it's so funny. And I don't and I don't necessarily want to create a story or 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 leave people feeling like they were trying to take advantage of you. But they were negotiating like men do where they put out an offer expecting that it'll get counter offered. But that didn't happen. And so they said, okay. Yeah. And that's the way it works. I've learned that in more recent times, too, that when somebody expects to get a counter offer, that you should deliver one of those and put it higher than what you expect to get in return, because you want to shoot for the stars and then get what you can out of it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we have enough exposure to negotiating. Maybe they'll come up with a board game for for you know little girls to help them negotiate. That would be a great great tool. I know, so funny. Oh, Joni, now share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake up call or an aha moment. Take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. Sure. I don't know how how many steps there were involved, but I guess it was hmm, maybe a decade and a half ago. This is when I was out there consulting after I had left uh, being a professor. And I was not really sure what I had to offer that others didn't, right? I, I thought, well, you know, there are a lot of really smart, experienced people out there who have the same expertise as I do. You know, I'm just one of many. And people kept saying, you should really have a personal brand. Everyone says, oh, you need to have a personal brand. I said, well, I don't really have a personal brand. My brand is the same as what everyone else is doing. And then somebody called me up and asked me to come in and develop an assessment center for executives. And 
they called me because they knew me from other projects I had worked on with them. And they said, well, you know, you're somebody, we need you because you're somebody who's very reliable, you're structured, you can get things done. And also, I started realizing that you know, they, they brought me in because I do the right thing, I'm very ethical. And I thought, after that, I realized, well, maybe I do have a personal brand. Maybe that's who I am. I'm somebody who gets results, I'm reliable, I show up, I'm ethical, and believe me, there are a lot of people around who don't have all of those characteristics. There are a lot mm -hmm. of people, especially in, in consulting and in my business, who talk the talk, but don't actually take action and get things done. So once I started realizing that, I started telling people that you know these are things that I can do that others can't, and it really has helped. Yeah, and I think what you point to, and I've heard this said before in terms of leadership, you know, that we all have a personal brand, but some of us are doing the work to make sure it gets promoted. Yep. <laughs> and some are keeping it kind of quiet. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I realized. I better take take this out there and put it out there to people. And that's when I network, you know, I talk about things that, that I've achieved and I can get results and and people respond to that and, and start to get it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And other than in in private conversations, is there anything else that you've done to make sure people know what your personal brand is? Because I think one thing where we can tend to fall down is because your brand is also how you want the world to see you, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just it's not just who you are; it's what you want projected out into the world. But that takes some intention. Is there anything else you're doing to help project the brand that you want to put out there out in the world? Oh, absolutely! I do a lot of work in social media. I have a website for my company, Flexible Work Solutions. And it, I put a lot of thought into how I wanted it to look and feel and what I wanted out there and very professional, you know, and, and certain specific things rather than going something very flashy. I wanted it to be professional and showing the, the feel of these kind of uh, traits that I have and characteristics that make me somebody that somebody that would be hireable. Yeah. Yeah, I think of it sometimes as uh, the same thought that goes into decorating your home, yep. um, what you put out there on social media, from the images you choose to the articles you choose to share to how you express a message, it definitely you know, all you want to make sure it all reflects who you are and, and how you want to represent your business. So that's amazing. All right, Joni, here's, here's a question I think that... Uh, It'll, it'll be interesting to, um, as someone who does leadership development, I'll be curious how you answer this question because you, you definitely get everyone has a different leadership style. Now, there are some qualities that, you know, are foundational to a leader, um, good communication skills, good, good listening, relationship building, but there, because of, we all have different personalities and strengths, we all lead a little bit differently. So how would you describe your leadership style? Well, my first reaction to that is I would say situational leadership because I do tend to flex quite a bit depending on who I'm working with and what the context is. And that way, I guess you would say I listen a lot and tune in to what's going on and what the needs are. So that's that's something that I, I think I specialize in. But something else has come up more recently for me, too, and that was a little bit of a wake-up call. And realizing that, you know, one of my recent projects is writing a book and finding out that I lead with ideas and messages, not just by hurting people around and doing certain mm -hmm. tasks and projects. So it's a little bit broader than that. And that's been something for me to realize that there is leadership in conveying the messages, just like you're doing with your podcast, getting the message out there of what women need to do to be successful in the workplace. Absolutely. I think you point to an Another thing where it's important not only to know your personal brand and what you want to put out into the world, but also what platform mm -hmm. you want to do it on now being being a bit of an extrovert <laughs> doing an audio podcast is is right up my alley. But I have a friend who would much rather write blog posts, write a book, write articles, and she's brilliant at the written word and she inspires and moves people through the written word. Whereas I do an okay job, but mm -hmm. I know my platform is more interacting with people live or through audio. Well, that's great. Yeah. Being aware of where your strengths are definitely is part of being a good leader. 
Yeah, absolutely. And for those who aren't familiar with situational leadership, I think you did a great job summing it up where mm-hmm. it's really being in tune, listening and paying attention and really being in tune to what's needed in any given situation and being adaptable to meeting the needs of the situation. Because as leaders, sometimes what people need is someone to take charge. And mm-hmm. sometimes what they really need is someone to just say, yeah, that's a great idea. Go with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so that's that's a having that flexibility is a, is a true strength. So that's fantastic. And Joni, what is one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, that would probably be my book flying without a helicopter, that is where I've taken lessons learned from successful people in the workplace, and I've been bringing it to younger people and Mm -hmm. helping them realize what they need. And the message there is it's so much more about some of these life skills that we've been talking about and not just the academics and the expertise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who have been brought up in the helicopter parenting generation, right, they tend to have great skills and expertise in academic world, but haven't learned how to be independent and as resilient and tough and uh, communicate as well as they might have if they haven't been brought up with parents hovering over them. So that's the message I've been doing. And it's just really exciting to work with younger people as well, because they have just so much more ahead of them in their lives and so much more they can do to, when they take heed to some of this advice that they can make changes in a big way for themselves. That's awesome. And who is the book written for? Well, it's kind of a broad audience. The book is written for younger people themselves from 15 to 25, also their parents who are raising them. And I also have a third audience of managers in the workplace who are managing younger folks coming in and how to deal with that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Especially when you're working with people who are used to having somebody else advocate for them and speak up when something's needed. You have to be what you were talking about, that situational leadership. You have to be in tune, attentive and listening for what the needs are. Right. Yes. And having opportunities to practice that and learn that the younger, the better. Right. Because it's something that you'll need all your life. And if you get to the workplace and you haven't had any experience doing that, you're in for a a very tough (laughs) haul there, I guess, for for the beginning years. Yes, but it can be quickly learned. That's the impression I'm getting from your book, that they can read it, they can pick up on some of these life skills, Mm -hmm. um, get some tools and strategies that they can, you know, pretty quick, I know quickly is a relative term, but, you know, Within, you know, a a short amount of time, be able to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not not just implement, but integrate these into who they are. So it's as if they they never had, they were never unaware of these things. Oh, great. Yeah, that's that's the uh, the goal. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I can't wait to hear more about it and some of the success stories and testimonials. And, you know, for those of you listening, I know there are some of you who your ears perked up just even thinking about a book like this. And we're going to share later. All the links are going to be on the show notes page. So you'll be able to find it there. And Jody, I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? Well, I I would say it's listening more and talking less. Sometimes it's so easy to give advice and really tell people what to do, but what you really need to know is what they need and what they want and helping to meet those needs. So quieting down and listening, sometimes it's hard to do, but it's, it's really important. How do you remind yourself or keep yourself in check when you feel this urge to maybe lead the conversation? Well, sometimes I even just hear myself going, wow, I think I'm doing more of the talking here. (laughs) I realize it's just me talking more than them and I need to calm down here and realizing, you know, starting out with questions is the way I like to start conversations, especially when I'm leading people is, you know, questions for them or, well, what are you hoping to accomplish and how do you think we should proceed and Uh, You know, those kind of things to help the person do it themselves and and find out what they need, you know, so that that's the way to to go in thinking about it is with questions in mind already rather Mm -hmm. than demands. 
Awesome. That's perfect. And what is one book other than Flying Without a Helicopter, How to Prepare (laughs) Young People for Work and Life? What is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? I would most certainly recommend Through the Labyrinth, Alice Eagley. Are you familiar with that book? No. Oh, it is. Tell me about it. Yes. It's a great book written specifically for women leaders. And it's talking about the difference for women moving up the, well, I guess you would say ladder, not the men, you know, and traditionally we think about going up straight line rung by rung, but for women, it tends to be sort of zigzagging through to get to the top. And there's a lot more subtleties necessary for women to be successful leaders, to be perceived as congruent with being a woman and some of those things, but also being perceived as a leader, which tends to be more male in people's eyes. So how do you navigate that without coming across and, you know, the words that people use, you know, too aggressive and all that. So Mm -hmm. that's what Through the Labyrinth is about. Oh, that's perfect. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to be picking that up shortly. (laughs) And it's very research based too. It's a good book. Oh, perfect. And Joni, what advice would you give your younger self? You know, I was thinking about that as we were going through these small moments and things. And I think all along, the thing that is really important for people in general and would have been important for me to learn is to be true to yourself, be true to myself, be authentic at an earlier age. And it's so easy, especially in the 20s, to try to fit in and do what you think you're supposed to do. And that's what I did. And I would have been much better off, I think, if I realized who I was and tried to be true to myself. Mm. And share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Ooh, that would be that. Be true to yourself. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. And that's something, to be honest with you, I have to remember all the time, even now, because it's so easy for people to push you into situations and... Mm -hmm. If, unless you realize, you know, that you're not being in a, going in a direction that you want to be going or that really feels comfortable for you, you know, it's hard to extract yourself. And so being true to yourself and also true to your values, that would be the second part of that. That is so huge. It's exactly what we were talking about earlier when I was sharing the experience my friend is having in her business and she's in her 40s. Right. So this isn't, you know, like teenager, young adult. This is I think at every stage when we get into new territory, we are listening more for the advice of those who have gone before us, for those who may have more wisdom. But at the crux of it all, I think you're exactly right. It's important that before you decide is to check in with yourself and make sure that you're being true to who you are and what your values are, because that's what's going to lead you in the right direction. Yeah, I had a situation like that come up just last week, in fact. And I realized (laughs) I was getting pushed and I was uncomfortable and I had to think about why. I said, this is not me and it's not the values that I abide by. And so I had to really push back in the situation. Mm. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, like I said, it still happens. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it can be really uncomfortable at first, but I find for myself and my own experience, when I do that time to reflect on what it is I want, what's really true for me, it's easier to overcome that push. Yep, absolutely. You know, or just explain myself and then whoever is doing the pushing kind of backs off. Yeah, you know, um, so yeah, it's such great advice, like gives you more confidence, puts you back in your own body, in your power, so that you can move forward in a way that's true to you. I yep. love that. So simple, but so powerful. <laughs> and Joni, lastly, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? Well, my website is flexibleworksolutions.com. That's for the company. You can find the book on there too. And that has its own website, which is flyingwithout.com. But uh, the way to get everything is Flexible Work Solutions. Yeah, that's your hub. Yeah, perfect. And for those of you who are listening, I know you guys are often listening in the car or on a jog. So, you know, you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. And Joni, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Well, thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. 
Are you ready to take the lead in your own life? Head over to womentl.com forward slash recognized to reserve your spot in my upcoming webinar on how to be recognized and rewarded for the work that you do. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me. And here's to your success.